was building the Ebola treatment centre and I had equipment in, I think, 11 airports and WHO made a statement that Kenya was at risk of, of you know, as an airport hub of getting Ebola and the next day every airline coming into Sierra Leone stopped services. It felt like one of those board games where you picked up a chance card and something had happened and you had to move back seven spaces. We're absolutely delighted to, to have you all here. This conference, this symposium has been a, a few months in the planning and under consideration and it's, it's nice to finally all be gathered in, in Quebec. We want to go beyond the le lesson learned and, and uh, try to get from different experts with different expertise uh, what would be the ideal response. We all work in very similar areas in terms of this sort of emergency response space, but we don't often all come together at meetings like this. Mid-March of 2014, uh, MSF in Guinea was alerted by the Ministry of Health about a cluster of uh, cases of an unusual disease, uh, several of whom died. Because of the suspicion of hemorrhagic fever, a team of ours from uh, Sierra Leone that had experience with Lhasa hemorrhagic fever moved up to Gekadu. So they were actually in Gekadu in Guinea where the center of the outbreak uh, started. On the 21st of March, it was confirmed to be Ebola, and that's when things really started going. There were cases reported uh, not only in Guinea Forestier, but across the border in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And so we set up a second uh, treatment unit in Macenta near uh, Gekadu. Uh, we dispatched a team to go to Monrovia because of the cases reported in Liberia and the concern of it going to the capital there. And then at the end of March, uh, confirmed cases appeared in Conakry and we were setting up our, uh, another treatment center there in Conakry. So we were already operating three treatment units and getting ready to set up a fourth within a, two or three weeks of the beginning of the outbreak. So things moved very quickly and this was very concerning because uh, we had not yet scaled up our available human resources. So we were stretched very thin uh, very early on. But the number of cases was, you know, sort of up and down. It actually cooled off a little bit in, in May and June, and, and people were lulled into a false sense of security, but maybe things were winding down. And then one of our epidemiologists did what's called a capture recapture study, and he got a hold of a, two different databases and compared the two of them and was able, through some mathematical uh, trickery, to come up with an estimate of the true number of cases that had occurred in the preceding several weeks. And instead of there being 200 cases, uh, there had been probably over 800 cases. And that was a significant moment because it meant that there was a lot more going on than we were prepared to deal with because we only had 120 bed ETU about to come online. So that was woefully inadequate. Uh, and so, uh, well, there's a scene in the movie Jaws where uh, Roy Scheider sees the shark for the first time and he says to Robert Shaw, uh, you're gonna need a bigger boat. And uh, so we decided to build a bigger boat and that's how Elwa 3 was born. And we expanded that from 120 to over 250 beds. And then the outbreak crept up in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia across the border and things uh, took fire in, in Monrovia in, in July and August, and that's when things really started getting uh, out of control. Ebola have been known for 40 years. In West Africa, we moving to part of the world, a part of Africa, a lot of people move. All the previous outbreaks were in part of the world where people don't travel, they stay in the village. So the outbreak is contained just by that. When I was sent to the uh, Ebola response in, in Liberia, I was asked to look at what makes this difference from an urban perspective. 
Uh, and the first thing we did was, was exactly look at the slum areas. And the origin of the slums in Liberia came out of the Civil War. These were people that had fled the countryside, had ended up in the cities, seeking refuge, seeking security, uh, were not given proper land or access to land to live on, and started exactly creating the slums. While all the, all the time maintaining their uh, social ties with their areas of origin. And so that aspect of much um, wider networks from urban to rural is, is what has changed the context. Because the moment the virus came to the city, people fled to the countryside, or the opposite. People fled from the countryside to seek assistance in the city or seek refuge with their relatives. And became a very highly mobile, moving uh, outbreak. We were looking at communities in Monrovia that suddenly became highly problematic. And we realized this was a community of uh, people coming all the way from Guinea. So there was a link, direct link between what happened in Guinea the week before and then what happened in uh, Monrovia a couple of days later. So we buried around 45,000 people over the course of the epidemic. And looking back, only about 5 to 7% of those burials were positive. But at the peak of the emergency, it was up to about 20% of all burials every day were positive. So there was what we call super spreading events from these burials where especially high level um, uh, people that were well respected in communities uh, where the funerals were extremely well attended, often from multiple locations. Uh, it was traditional to touch or to wash the body. That it acted as a major vector. I mean, burial of, the, of, of your family and, and your dead is a very um, personal and, and culturally, cultural thing. And, you know, many people saw it as disrespectful. We were, and, and it was. I mean, we were coming in plastic with faceless, you know, masks and we were putting people in plastic bags. and. And, you know, we were at least burying in single graves, but, but outside of that, it, it really, you know, it came across as, as mass burial and, and mistreatment. And there was a lot of stigma related to it. If you had the burial team come to your house, then not only did we disrespect the body, but you were then stigmatised as potentially Ebola and, and ostracised from the rest of your community at a time where people would normally gather around you and support you. I think the second thing was there was a lot of misunderstandings and rumours. So there was rumours that we were, um, not just us, but, but other people bearing bodies were taking organs or, you know, misusing the bodies and, and, and you know, doing things other than, than burying them. And I think the other big point of contention was that we had to bury everyone like that. So even people who was fairly obvious that they hadn't died of Ebola, people that were, you know, 90 who had been sick for 10 years, who passed away in their sleep, uh, we still buried uh, with safe precautions and, and the government's brought in fairly clear bylaws. This was because it was very hard to know who had Ebola and who didn't and to try to reduce that stigma around Ebola burials, which is why we buried so many people. But it developed a lot, you know, we first started, it was called dead body management. That was the, the term for it before this outbreak and the focus was very much on protecting our volunteers and, and the staff. And once we got some more experience, we were able to transition that to where we really ended up at the end in Guinea dressing family members and, and Red Cross staff weren't even in PPE anymore. And we, were allowed, we found ways to help families bury their dead safely. But it took a lot of time and a lot of experience to get there. Ebola is ideally a localized phenomenon. It's very dramatic and it kills people and it draws a lot of attention, whereas Zika, Zika flew under the radar for a long time. The concerning part of Zika is that there is some mosquito that can carry the virus. And we all know that it's very difficult to eradicate the disease if the virus is in a reservoir in the country. And we saw that for West Nile, for example. Uh, so the big concern is that the virus will arrive because we had a lot of traveler that came and mosquito can bite them, then transmit the virus to other people.
the world has become urban. And uh, I often ask the question when I'm speaking to people, how many of you live in a city? And all the hands go up. But when I ask how many of your grandparents lived in cities, half of them go up. And our point is, from our point of view, I work for you in Habitat, is that it's changing everything else. It's changing the way disease outbreaks function, and the Ebola crisis in West Africa in 2014 was a key example. The moment the virus entered into the city, everything changed. And it was to do exactly with the way cities have grown and the way people were moving around. So it became a highly dynamic, very complex thing to deal with. And people did not understand, acknowledge what the context was, what urban, what cities meant to the disease. And that's, for me, is, is a game changer. As part of that, if we say cities, we're not talking about nicely planned neighborhoods and environments. I mean, over the years, because we have not dealt with urbanization, we have seen and we continue to see the growth of slums. And slums are highly dense, no sanitation, no toilets, uh, environments where people don't trust government. And that in itself makes it even more complicated. And that's, but that's the reality. That's where urban poverty is concentrated. Even if you would build a clinic, a formal clinic, those people don't have access. But I think the other issue to that urbanisation is the lack of infrastructure or the, the missing infrastructure, especially in the poor and marginalised sections of those urban contexts, where lack of sanitation and garbage collection and water is, is you know, breeding ground for, for this type of, of epidemic. A lot of the times we focus on the problems today and the message with urbanisation is we really need to look ahead, decades ahead, and plan for that. If we don't, 30, 40 years down the line, we'll, we'll be facing uh, a complexity and will change the way outbreaks are happening that we won't be able to deal with. The urbanization now in Africa would actually put more in contact what is existing in the forest and animal world with actually the, the human being. And this is happening more and more with domestic animals, like chicken for flu, for instance. And this is also something that is a little bit different from what we know. But having pathogen from animal infecting human is not new, but the context and the new settings with urbanization, increased population, is something that is setting the stage to have to give an opportunity to those pathogens to really explode and imp impact the global level. Weak health systems are not prepared to rapidly contain disease outbreaks. I mean, if we had, let's say, optimal health systems everywhere, possibly a lot of these outbreaks could be contained rapidly, but we don't have that. We spent in the Ebola response three times more than it would have cost if we just achieved universal health coverage in those countries. So while the outlay is, is a lot of money, and it does take time, it's not overnight, by not doing that, we are constantly at risk of huge, expensive outlays later. With Zika, uh, we're seeing the same. We're looking at costs particularly to the Caribbean and poorer parts of Central America, which will run into the billions of dollars. So if we accept that that's OK, then we just carry on as we, as we are. Um, and the, 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 what is depressing is, is being involved in lots of conversations and continually, continually saying there is no investment on this. There's no resources going into health system strengthening. Um, politicians are not keeping their promises when they do make commitments. And then we inevitably have to sit back and say, fine, then we'll pay the consequences. And it's called outbreak management. And then it, that is way more expensive always than prevention. So we are the research uh, the infectious disease research center at the University of Laval. 
And uh, this is the, the, the center right there in the beginning of the labs. And uh, a lot of work is being done on viruses, bacteria, and parasites. We're working on a vaccine uh, against Zika with uh, Dr. Sylvie Trotti, who is the head of the, the clinical unit. Somebody that is infected with a pathogen, okay? Let's call it pathogen dangerous. And when this pathogen is being detected, we still don't know what pathogen dangerous is. We just know that it's dangerous and it's killing people, okay? Well, we can go and let's say that it's the beginning. We realize there is people being severely ill and even dying. We can go and take blood from survivors, okay? And we can isolate their own defense that they have been able, that they have um, um, developed. And if they are survivors because they won, you know, every pathogen, it's a battle between the host and the pathogen. And some, sometimes the pathogen wins and sometimes the host wins. But in all cases, there is always survivors. Even if you have 97% mortality rate, it means you have 3% of people that survives. And so these people have been able to develop a good defense against the pathogen. We can now, we have a specialized equipment, we can now go and isolate those defense and make it in a test tube to give to somebody else within about five weeks at small scale. Uh, and so, so this is what we're doing here. And now we're pushing, pushing this technology even more where, for example, let's say there is pathogen dangerous and we don't know about this pathogen. We can now have, if people are sick, Okay, we can go take the blood, isolate the component of their defense that we're interested in that is able to, to fight back this pathogen and come back with the treatment based on it, okay? We don't even know what the pathogen is and we don't need to know. That's what's cool about this. On day one of the outbreak response, you're already behind. You don't have the machinery in place to respond to the outbreak. And you need to build up all of that capacity and get it moving. And it has to be a comprehensive response. So you need a contact tracing system. So you have to train contact tracers. You need a place to put the, the sick patient. So you have to build an, an ETU. You have to train the staff for the ETU. You have to set up a means for transporting patients from the community into the ETU. You have to set up a, an active case finding system and doing case investigations. You have to train burial teams and then they have to bury uh, the people who uh, passed away. And not only that, usually there's a backlog of corpses already by that uh, time. So you're really behind. And if you start thinking that I'm gonna go into this unsure of what it's gonna become and I'll commit some resources and we'll scale up, you, you just get further and further behind. So in order to launch things effectively, you have to go in strong. You, you know, if you don't put somebody on uh, community relations and uh, health communications immediately, uh, you get behind because rumors start circulating, people start coming to their own conclusions. There's, there's you, nature abhors a vacuum and uh, the community will fill up the space with rumors if you don't put some information out there uh, ahead of time. Greater investments in, in local capacities is absolutely critical. Um, and that means also working with local community structures, local community networks, um, youth organizations, women's groups, religious leaders. I think we need to, to work with, with those organizations and invest in that process as if a disease outbreak were to happen in the next few days, even though it may not happen ever. So uh, sometimes it's difficult to make those investments if we don't see the, the immediate uh, use or the immediate application, but I think that long-term perspective is absolutely critical. Ebola or Zika thing. These are diseases that exist for years. Ebola has been there since 1976, Zika since 47. Uh, you can name whatever. All this right now, you can name 10 different viruses that may have the same trajectory like Ebola or Zika. They are there, nobody is taking care of them. So focusing on what is important at the local level in terms of disease and taking care of that is absolutely critical because while doing that, you get the local people that are the first responder usually and the first line, get them prepared to contain any disease that is starting and preventing it from going global. In order to detect a new infection or an increasing number of cases, you have to have a surveillance system. 
people not gonna send you a sample saying, okay, it's Ebola. That it's already late in the, in the process. So you have to offer to the population a system where they can treat the basic everyday problem. And at the village level, most of the problem is malaria, diarrhea, and, and the thing. And if you offer support for that, then if there is something different, they will come to you. And they will say, well, this diarrhea, but not like last week, is something different. And then they will have the system. An example uh, that the fire department at the airport that is always maintained, but sometimes never used. But there is some funding for them to be there because you expect them to be there if something arrives. And we should try to find a way to support them like we support that kind of, of uh, unit that are never used. Consistently seeing no real money going into what I would call preparedness as a drive towards universal health coverage, the sustainable development goals are talking about UHC, but there's no fiscal mechanism. The only fiscal mechanisms we got are around um, insurance mechanisms if a country experiences an outbreak. Now, potentially that's a disincentive for a country to invest in, um, in data surveillance, capacity building, training building up of laboratory facilities. So there's contradictory processes uh, actually going on right now in the, in, in the global conversations. Let's say the international system to deal with crisis uh, in a way is fairly new. I think more, a lot of it is post-Second World War. Uh, and we've developed this big international system to deal with, uh, with crisis internationally. We have a humanitarian, whole humanitarian system in place. But in, in a way, it was designed to deal with acute emergencies um, and be able to deliver response quickly. But it was an external effort. In cities in particular, uh, which are highly complex environments, because in the beginning we were dealing with responding to rural areas, where societies were much clearer, uh, dealing with rural communities. In cities, you're dealing with a much more complex situation. And so for us, in terms of optimal response is one, being able to recognize the complexity of the environment, and then two, empower the local actors, empower the local communities, uh, the, the mayors, the local governments. And that often does not happen because the whole system is set up according to sectors. We talk about health in one side, we talk about education on the other side, we talk about shelter in another corner. But cities are, are not like that. Everything is connected, is interconnected in a city. And if you don't understand that integration, that it's a system, you will not find a proper way out. To give an example, when I arrived in, uh, in Monrovia during the Ebola response, I entered the coordination meeting. People were only talking about the national level. There were maps on the wall of the national situation. We were in Monrovia, Monrovia on the map, was a very dark red spot. It was 50% of the cases. But most of the time was spent talking about remote communities elsewhere and hardly any discussion on how to deal with the specific uh, situation in Monrovia, which was in a way the key. It was 50% of the cases, but also, as we said, that's where things uh, got out of control. But the mayor of Monrovia was not in the room. As an urban expert, first thing I did was go and see her. What's, what's your understanding of the situation? What are the most problematic neighborhoods? What's the reaction of the community? What are you doing? And she was saying, she was explaining, giving me a whole explanation about how she was organizing community leaders. She had brought them together in her city hall, uh, how they were networking uh, across the city, how she was going down to check on markets, on transport hubs, and specific neighborhoods at risk, and trying to engage communities. While at the same time, a kilometer away, people were talking planning community engagement, but actually not connecting with the system that exists locally. And for me, that was a fundamental, a fundamental error. And my, my job was to to make that connection between local actors, and there's nobody more, I'm not saying local governments are the solution, but they are the ones in the front line in terms of, that's where people turn to when it comes to uh, their needs and their desires. I mean, the anthropological analysis proved invaluable in the Ebola response partly because of the way the virus was, was being transmitted, which was through, through burial practices, principally. 
So going into a, into a community and overruling traditional mechanisms of, of essentially helping the soul pass to the afterlife, if you ignore that, overrule it and try and sanitize it in a way that people don't understand and will not engage with you on, the net result is that they will retract from that public advice or the local policing mechanism and they'll bury it nighttime instead. And that's exactly what we saw, night burials. And where we went wrong with Ebola is that we went in there thinking it was some kind of flood or a, an earthquake or something. And a lot of the discussions and analysis were about pre-positioning supplies, moving of assets, how many trucks do we need, where did we put the warehouse? And there's really an absence of, of genuine interrogation of the viral movements in, um, in an evolving crisis. The World Bank were telling us there were going to be around 1.3 million infections in Africa alone uh, by January 2015. So we were working on the assumptions that this was going to go well beyond the three affected countries. This was inevitably going to become a West African epidemic, it was going to become an, uh, an African epidemic, and of course with, with, with splinters of infection going off into Europe and, and anywhere. This was the, the, the premise that we were forced to work under, and it was the right thing to do. In retrospect, there are only 28,000 infections, so everybody's saying, why did we spend so much money and all the hoopla and all the assets and the money that was spent? But because that money was spent, we avoided, potentially, a global pandemic. Countries like Uganda have shown that if you are on your toes and you respond quickly and in a way that everyone is you know, ready to respond uh, together, yeah, you can get on top of these things. A lot of it's just having the community on board. Uh, you know, I'll, the reason the West African outbreak became the West African outbreak was that we were unable to link up with the community as a partner in disease control early on and there was a lot of resistance and that's happened before um, but it was happened this time in a way that was coupled with a lot of mobility so people moved about while they were incubating the disease popping up left and right and so we were unable to contain the problem um, so that kind of mobility is probably going to be there in the future and other diseases might exploit it um, I hope in a less dramatic way. But this is going to be our way of life. We should be ready on living that way. So what it means is that we need to change the way we handle those things. Because we're going to have more and more disease jumping around the world. And we are very ill-prepared at this stage, even though we have tremendous effort made after this Ebola. So for me, what is important is to mobilize people around those challenges, because I know we can do it. It's just about making sure that the way we are dealing with those some years ago is not relevant anymore. We have to change the way we're dealing, and that's why I think this meeting is critically important in the way that they gather good people that know, that have the right expertise, that have a broad, large expertise on different areas, ranging from social science to highly innovative technology. And I think, and covering all the continuum of activities, whether it's media, health economics, and things, I think that's very important. That's the way we should handle those things, an integrated approach, and make sure now this is going to be the way of life. And we cannot deal it like just as technical problem or just social problem. It has to be seen as like a global, integrated approach.